So we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to thank everybody for joining us remotely and here in the room. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Anna Iverson. I am Assistant Communications Specialist here at the LSU Ag Center. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, Best Practices for Making Your Publication PDFs and Web Pages, web pages More Accessible. Uh, this is hosted by the Association of Communications Excellence. I serve as the chair of the organization's publication and graphic design learning community, which is hosting today's webinar. This webinar will be recorded and made available online following the presentation. So the speakers we have today will be Liz Black. Uh, she is an IT analyst for information technology here at the LSU Ag Center. And myself, uh, we are part of the 88 team here at the LSU Ag Center and have been working together to pull information about accessibility for our organization. In this webinar, Liz will cover information on how to make your publication web pages more accessible by focusing on what to do with your publication content. I will cover some how-tos when it comes to making your PDFs accessible, and I will highlight some tools that you can use in Adobe InDesign and Adobe Acrobat. At the end, we can open it up for questions. So without further ado, I'll hand this over to Liz to begin our presentation. Okay, so what is web accessibility? It's the pra practice of ensuring people with disabilities have equal access to information and functionality of websites as people without disabilities. So my goal today is to give you some good information to help you make your web pages accessible. So I'm going to be discussing the main components of web pages and how to make them accessible. So the main components of web pages are your content or your main body text, documents, images, and videos. So the content or the main body text also have sections underneath that, like headings, all caps, underlining, lists, links, and tables. Headings are used to add structure and a reading order to the, your web pages. So you, there can only be one H1 heading, which is your main title on your page. And then underneath the H1 heading or main title, then you have your subtitles or subheadings, which are H2 headings. And then if you also have subtitles underneath your, underneath your H2 headings, then those are H3 headings and so on. However, H4, H5, and H6 headings or subtitles are sub, seldom used. Here's an example of H1, H2, and H3 headings at the very top you'll see the basic accessibility requirements for electronic media. That's the H1 or the main title on the page. And then underneath that, you'll see an H2 and an H3. All caps. You should always avoid using all caps because screen readers may read the all caps as an acronym. They'll just read one letter at a time. So it's confusing to a person who is using a screen reader. Microsoft Word has an easy way to remove all caps from your documents. In this PowerPoint presentation, I have a link to the page. So like, for example, important in all caps, it would read I-M-P-O-R-T-A-N-T -T to a person using a screen reader. If you want your text to stand out of the pay on the page, you can always use bold or italics or bold italics. Underlining you should avoid using on web pages, and the reason is because browsers underline hyperlink text by default. So the screen readers may see an underlined word as a link. So if you look on the slide, the second text that is linked to a web page is underlined by default. And that actually links to a web page. <clears throat> list. Use lists to group similar information. So you should not use hyphens in lit to list. You should use either bulleted lists or numbered lists. The uh, unordered or bulleted list is like with the bullet points. And then the numbered or ordered list is with the numbering system. If you use a numbered list, your number, it should be when the order of items are important. Links. All links must contain either text or an image with alt text that describes where the link is going. So clearly describe where the link is going. Hyperlink text should pre 
provide a clear description of the link destination instead of providing the URL. So you don't just copy and paste the URL or the web address onto the page because a screen reader will read the whole URL. So you would use text, like for example, my example I have on there is lsuaccenter.com portals, communications, publications, newsletters, horticulture sense, hints. You wouldn't put that whole URL on there, but instead you could say we have recently started offering the horticulture hints newsletter for your region, and then you would link the URL to the text. And then that describes where the link is going to, which is, is the horticulture hints newsletter. <clears throat> Avoid redundant links, like linking an image and text. If you have an image on the page and then text underneath, if you link them both, the screen reader will read the same information twice. So you either want to link the image or link the text, not both. When linking to a page outside of your website, you should make sure the new page opens in a new window. Also, any outside website or resource should also be accessible or ADA compliant. Tables, you should use simple data tables with row headers, column headers, or both. Do not use layouts, or do not use tables to control your layout. Do not use nested tables, which are tables within tables. And do not use images of tables on web pages. An image of a table is an image, it's not a table. I've noticed that quite often, that people make an image of a table, but that's not a table. Here's an example of a simple data table. At the top, you have your columns, and then down at the side, you can have rows. So as long you can have just columns or just rows, or you can have columns and rows. So there's a website called Wave, and there's a link to it where you can check your web page to make sure it's accessible. And what you'll do is you paste into where it says, uh, you would copy the web address or the URL and paste it into the box that says web page address when you're on the WAVE site. And then it'll tell you the errors on the page that you need to correct to make your page accessible. At the bottom of each page on your website, there should be an accessibility statement. Like at the Ag Center, we will be putting an accessibility statement, so y'all don't have to worry about that. For, for others that you may do one page at a time, each page, or you can have your programmer put that at the bottom in your footer on each page. And there's information on developing an accessibility statement. I have a link to that in the PowerPoint. Documents. So you have PDF files, Word files, or other files. So Anna is going to go the, into this in much greater detail, so I'm just going to briefly explain a few things. So PDF files. From all the research that I've done on PDFs, I have found that it, experts say you should limit PDFs on web pages, unless you have a good reason for having one. So if you have a good reason for a PDF, it's best to put all the content from the PDF onto the page also. Even if your PDF, if, even if you put all the content on the page, your PDF still needs to be accessible. One reason for this is even though search engines don't usually put a PDF at the top of the search results, it is possible that a PDF could show up before the page does. So if a person who is visually impaired is searching for information and your information comes to the top of the page in the form of a PDF, and it's not accessible, then you have an accessibility issue. So here are some good reasons for having a PDF on your web page. Long documents or reports where it would be difficult to put all that information on one page. Publications that require posting on the web. Printable forms, unless your website allows you to put printable forms directly on the page itself. A good question to ask yourself is, <coughs> what is the reason you want to put a PDF on your page? So if you say, well, this is just what we've always done, or it's easy, those are not good reasons. <laughs> Benefits to limiting PDFs on websites. So search engine optimization, you may or may not be familiar with that, but that's the process of optimizing your website content 
so that people can find it when they search on the internet, which is all of our goals when we have content on the website. We want people to be able to find it. So search engines like Google can easily locate and read PDF files, but they often lack information that search engines can see what the content's about, which affects your position in search re results. So what this means is search engines rarely put a PDF at the top of the page. Visitors can more easily engage and interact with your web page. Uh, visitors to your website must make an additional click on the PDF before they can view the content. The number of people using phones and tablets to access the internet is increasing and PDFs are not mobile friendly. So try going to a web page on your phone that has a PDF and you have to download it to your phone before you can even view the information. Who wants a website that's just full of PDFs? When a web page has a paragraph or two of information describing the content in a PDF, it's usually not very visually pleasing to the eye. It's much easier to correct or update a web page than it is a PDF on a web page. Because a PDF on a web page, you have to download it, fix it, and then re-upload it. On the web page itself, you just go in there, correct it, save it, and whatever your publishing process is, usually pretty quick. Document remediation. So this is the process of making your files accessible to people with dis disabilities. Remediating or fixing PDFs is sometimes a complicated and lengthy process depending on the complexity of your PDF. If you try just one time to remediate a complex PDF, you will know what I'm talking about. Anna and I have done several, and it's very frustrating at times to reme remediate a complex PDF. It's much easier to create an accessible PDF than it is to fix or remediate it afterwards, which that makes sense because just about anything you do in life, if you do it right the first time, it's better to do that than try to fix it afterwards. You must have a program capable of making PDFs accessible. So programs for remediating PDFs, Adobe Acrobat Pro. This is one you have to purchase or subscribe to. I also found this one called PAVE. It's a free program you can use to validate and fix PDF accessibility. There are several other programs available, but these are the ones that I've actually used or referred to other people that have used. I've actually had a couple people use PAVE and they were able to make their PDF accessible. But like I said, it's better to create it accessible than it is to try to fix it. So here's the best method for creating an accessible PDF. So you start with the source file, like a Word document or InDesign, or you can even use PowerPoint. And these source files allow you to add accessibility properties that can be converted or exported as a PDF. It's much easier to start with a source file and make it accessible than it is to remediate or fix an existing PDF like I've pre said previously. I used Word to create this whole webinar in, and you can actually open up the accessibility bar to the right, and as you create the document, it will tell you if you need to fix anything. So you don't have to get to the whole end, and then you click to check for accessibility issues, and you see a ton of things you need to fix. You can do it as you go along, so it's not so overwhelming. If you need to make changes to a PDF, always go back to your source document. If possible, make the changes and then convert or export as a PDF again. Do not try to make changes to the existing PDF if you already have created it in a source file. It's best everything if you create it in the source file, Word document, InDesign, PowerPoint, and then you can, um, it's so much easier to deal with. So here's some links to information on making files accessible. And that's in the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Those will actually link to the pages that give you more information. You can read files out loud using Word or, or Adobe. It'll give you an idea of what a person who's visually impaired hears when a screen reader reads a document to them. However, there are a few differences, such as these file readers they don't read all caps as an acronym, like the screen readers usually read it as an acronym. So Word, I have a link to the directions on how to access the speak command in Word. 
And then PDF, if you use Adobe Acrobat Pro, it has where you can click on view and then read out loud and then select the appropriate links. And it'll actually read the document to you. You have to highlight what portion usually of what you want it to read to you. But it gives you an idea. Images. All images must have alt tags or alt attributes, alternative text. Alt texts are a brief description of the image. This is the information that screen readers read to a person who is vis visually impaired to describe the image to them. Images on web pages have three main purposes. They either convey simple information or complex information, or they're just there for decorative purposes. Simple images include pictures, icons, drawings, or logos. Alt text should describe the image as concisely as possible and contain all the text in the image. However, you should try to avoid having text in your images. You should limit your alt text to 125 characters or less. Long alt text would result in a poor experience for those using screen readers. If the image requires a longer description, you should describe the image in the content of your article and then provide a short alt text. However, you should not describe your image in the content on the page and use the same wording in the short alt text. It should be different wording because the screen reader will read it twice. So complex information consists of graphs and charts that require just more information than just a short alt text. Complex images, they, like gra graphs, charts, diagrams, may need a long description, which is longer than 125 characters. So think about the information that the graphic conveys, and then that information you put into a long description in the content section of the page. It's just a more detailed description where you explain exactly what the chart or graph or diagram is about. When assistive technology reads the description of a complex image to a person who is visually impaired, it should be the text equivalent of information that a, someone who can visually see it, sees so it, they can understand what's going on. Decorative. Decorative images are only for decoration. And they do not convey any important information or meaning at all. You can use a method to tell screen readers to ignore the image. However, it still requires alt text, but it should be empty alt text. So for example, in the alt text section, you would just put two quotations if it's just a decorative image. If you don't put any information in the alt text when it's a decorative image, then the screen reader will read the image, they'll read the name. So if you have a camera that named your image DSC0001, that's what it's going to read to the person. And so that's why you want to just put two quotations into your alt field. So then it will skip the image and it won't say anything. So here is how you should write good alt text. Write the alt text in the proper context based on the content surrounding the image. Since screen readers automatically announce that it's an image, you don't need to put image of or picture of in your alt text description. Describe the image as concisely and clearly as possible, but keep it to no more than 125 characters. If an image needs a longer description, describe the image in the content of the article and provide a shorter alt text. However, do not duplicate the description in the alt text and its <coughs> content, because like I said earlier, the screen re reader will read that information twice. As with any text, use proper punctuation, spelling, and spacing in the alt text. This makes the information easier to understand. Try to avoid using images with text. I see that quite often. Someone will submit an article and all it will be is an image with text on it. Well, screen readers and search engines cannot read text within images. So then, uh, if you do have to have an image with text, then all that text should be within the, either the alt text or on the page if it's a lot of information. But then if you have an image with a lot of text on it, and then you also put that text in your content on the page, then to a person who can see the page, 
it's duplicate information. So you don't want to do that either. So you wouldn't want to just have a, an image with all the text on it. Provide the content and the function of the image. If you have an image with a link, the alt text should describe the image and where the link is going. Like for example, LSU Accenture logo, if you have that linked to the home page, then you should say something like LSU Ag Center logo home or something like that to let them know that that link is going to the home page on the LSU Ag Center website. There's no perfect description every time. Try testing the description by describing to the image to someone over the phone. So here's an example of alt text for images. So, okay, the, you see the image. So I have three descriptions. Roses, two red roses on a bush, one red rose on the left, and a red blossoming rose on the right of a rose bush with stems that have stickers and leaves and blurred green grass in the background. So which description is best? Two red roses on a bush. If you do have something that needs more, a longer description, Remember, you would put that in the content of your article. So videos. Make videos accessible by adding closed captioning, or CC. Closed captioning can be added to your videos when you use video sharing websites like YouTube or Vimeo. Always edit the text in closed captioning to correct any typos. Not only is this for ADA compliance purposes, but is, as a professional, we should want to do that anyway. So here are some quality standards for closed captioning. It must be accurate and relay the exact words with correct spelling, punctuation, and grammar with 99% accuracy. This actually comes from the Federal Communication Commission. Must be included from start to finish and must be synchronized with the words spoken. So in conclusion, why is accessibility important? Well, the number of federal website accessibility lawsuits have been increasing by almost three times from 2017 to 2018. The lawsuits for federal, this is federal websites lawsuits, 814 in 2017 and 2,250 in 2018. In fact, website complaints are becoming the biggest target for ADA lawsuits the public and private sector are both experiencing it. I've seen several companies, Beyonce, her website was sued, Winn-Dixie, lots of private. So public, this is definitely the law for um, our website to be compliant. Since March 2014, the maxim, maximum civil penalty for first time offenses was 75,000 mm -hmm. and then subsequent violations, 150,000. However, if your website is not compliant and you receive a complaint against you, the Department of Justice will give you a chance to make your website accessible, but they will give you a dead deadline. And uh, ADA compliance helps those with disabilities, but it also has benefits for everyone else. For example, almost everyone has used closed captioning, especially when you're in a noisy room, or if you don't want to have it read out loud and you can just listen to or watch the closed captioning when you're watching something. It helps with SEO or search engine optimization by improving the readability of your site when search engines crawl your pages. All communication should be access accessible and that includes websites, social media, and email. Not only is it the law, but as, a, as responsible professionals we should want everyone to have equal access to our information. So that's, for, that's all for me. Now to Anna. Awesome. Thank you, Liz. I'm just going to switch out of these PowerPoints real quick. Okay, for this section of the webinar, I'll show you how to use Adobe InDesign to make your PDF accessible. I'm going to focus on the main items required for accessibility. Now, I'll be, show, I'll be throwing a lot of information at you quickly. Um, so I apologize for that just because it's due to time. 
However, I have written up a full Word document of everything I'm about to tell you, plus more. Um, that will include uh, creating captions for images, footnotes and endnotes, converting InDesign objects to figures, interactive hyperlinks in InDesign, artifacting objects, and creating a table of contents. Uh, it's just we have limited time and I've already written up a whole bunch. So I do want to provide that information to you. So you can contact me or I can try to put it on the ACE website. All right, so let's begin. So I'll, I'll be referring to these two programs, uh, Adobe Acrobat Pro DC. Uh, this is the subscription version of Adobe Acrobat. It's important that you have the professional version of Acrobat DC because the standard version does not contain any of the accessibility features that I will be showing you. Um, we also will be talking about Adobe InDesign CC 2019. Uh, it has many versions and I'm going to be referring to the Adobe InDesign CC 2019 with the latest updates applied as of April 2019. Uh, it's important to pay attention to what version of InDesign you are using. In uh, 2018, Creative Cloud introduced a whole bunch of new accessibility features uh, in InDesign that I will be discussing. So make sure your program is up to date. So I'm just going to talk briefly, uh, what is accessibility? Uh, generally defined, accessibility refers to making things accessible to people with disabilities or impairments. In this section, we will be focusing on digital accessibility, particularly PDF accessibility. The PDF file format is one of the most widely distributed file formats in the world for its ability to maintain the visual look and feel across multiple platforms and devices. Because of its wide distribution, it becomes very important to make these files accessible digitally to all users. When we talk about PDF accessibility, as well as other digital accessibility for that matter, we are talking about the ability of users with visual, mobility, and other impairments to read and navigate a document in the equivalent matter as a sighted user. Users with impairments can use screen reading software such as JAWS, NVDA, as well as other software solutions to read and navigate a document. The U.S. government mandate called Section 508 states that all federal agencies are required to make their electronic documents accessible to people with disabilities. Um, regardless of whether you work for a U.S. or other government agency, access to information is a fundamental human right and we need to take the responsibility for the documents that we create to ensure that they are in fact accessible to all users who wish to use the documents. Acrobat DC provides a built-in accessibility checker that checks, uh, that, that checks that accessibility of a document at a base level. It makes sure that the major requirements for accessibility have been met for a reasonably good reading experience for those using screen reader software. For more robust PDF accessibility standards, refer to WCAG 2.0, which are the PDF techniques for web content accessibility gu guidelines. WCAG is the same standard used for websites, but has been adjusted for PDF. PDF UA, which stands for Universal Accessibility, is even more robust. PDF UA is by far the most stringent of the standards and requires the most effort to get a PDF compliant. It contains 31 checkpoints and 136 failure conditions. So which one do we use? Uh, the best to use is probably PDF UA since it offers the highest level of compliance. However, it requires the most effort to meet that compliance. In our line of work, time is often the biggest challenge for us. So when creating PDFs for your organization, ask yourself what the target is. Some will say the Acrobat Accessibility Check is sufficient enough at a base level standard. Some will say WCAG 2.0 and others PDF UA. Hopefully though, this gives you some options to research so you know what questions to ask your organization. So how do we check PDFs for accessibility? There are a variety of tools out there that help you and Acrobat Accessibility Check is a good one to use since it's built into your Acrobat Pro DC. You can find it by going to the Accessibility tool in Acrobat Pro DC. Another good tool to use is PA, uh, PAC 3.0 Checker. This is a free standalone application that can be downloaded onto your computer. This, is a, this tool is a Windows only product, unfortunately, um, and I'll provide the link to that at the end of this pre presentation. PAVE is a free tool online and I'll, I'll provide that link as well. 
But throughout this webinar, we will be focusing on the Acrobat Accessibility Checker. All right, so creating an accessible PDF file from Adobe InDesign. When authoring documents using Adobe InDesign or other tools, it's important to follow a few basic steps to assure your document is readable by individuals with disabilities once you have exported it as a PDF. InDesign offers a simple workflow that reduces the time and effort required to produce accessible PDF documents from an InDesign layout. Doing these steps in InDesign will reduce the post-export work you will do in Acrobat Pro to make your document more accessible. For your PDF to pass any accessibility information onto the PDF file, you must go to the file menu and choose export. Generating a PDF file by going to the file menu and choosing print and choosing Adobe PDF will not work and will not pass accessibility standards. Um, so in the Save As type drop down menu, you create an accessible PDF by using Adobe PDF Interactive or Adobe PDF Print. So let's talk about the difference of those. For Adobe PDF Interactive, you would want to use this method if you are including interactive buttons or an interactive form field in your PDF file. There aren't as many options in this export than there are with the print function, but it will still work. You will want to enable the Create Tagged PDF checkbox, and then you will also tell it to use the structure of the document for the tab order. You can control the viewing of the document output to spreads or individual pages. Under advanced, you can make sure to display the document title instead of the file name. You can also make sure it says English for language. Okay, for Adobe PDF print, it gives you some additional features. Oftentimes these files are intended to be posted on the web and a lot of times in InDesign, we are using high resolution images. With this in mind, typically it's best to go to the smallest file size, but you can determine that using any of these presets to customize them. Also, it is important that you enable tagged PDF checkbox for the tags to be assigned when the PDF is exported. Down at the bottom, hyperlinks are also very important, as are the bookmarks, so enable the, both of those options as well. You can adjust the compression fur further if you wish. Uh, marks and bleeds don't really apply with this type of document and output is related to your color conversion. So when you go to the advanced category, change the display title to document title and the language to English. And we'll talk about how to make the document title here in a minute. This will get you the settings you need to make an accessible PDF file. So if you want to save these settings as a preset so you don't have to continue to click on these buttons each time. Um, click on the Save Preset button on the lower left corner and give it a name. I call mine PDF Accessibility, and you can go ahead and click OK, and that will save all the settings you just enabled for future exports. Required metadata. There is some required metadata that you need to add to an accessible PDF in order for it to pass the Acrobat Accessibility Checker. To add metadata to your file, go to the File menu and choose File Info. Inside of this file information dialog box, at the top is the document title field where you can add that metadata. Now the document title field is really the only required piece of metadata, but I encourage you, to, especially if your document is intended to be posted on the web, to add additional metadata here to assist in search engine op optimization. So you can add the document title, you can add the author, description, keywords, you can also add a copyright notice if necessary. So once you export your PDF, you can go to the file menu in Adobe Acrobat and choose properties, and you can see that all your metadata carried over. If you go to the initial view tab, um, the document title is set to be displayed, so you can see that carried over. This is exactly what you need from a metadata perspective when you export a PDF file out of InDesign. So InDesign styles and tag structure. One of the most important things you can do in your InDesign layout to ensure proper tagging when you export to an accessible PDF is to utilize paragraph styles when you're formatting the text of the document. By using styles, you get, you get consistent formatting throughout your document, but you can also control which tag gets assigned to that text when it gets exported to a PDF. Once you start working in InDesign more and more with the intent to export to an accessible PDF, you're going, sorry, you're going to start to think about this upfront instead of at the very end. 
So in the beginning of your design, start thinking about what you want to be the H1, H2, and so on, and start to style your content with that in mind. So right click on your style and choose edit, and this will bring up the paragraph style options. At the bottom, there's a category called export tagging where you will tell that style what tag should be associated with it. You'll see that there will be all of the heading options available, including artifact. One thing I did learn doing this research is for some reason there is an H tag in there and it's recommended to never use that. It's just there as a relic and it will not pass. <coughs> now you don't have to go through each style individually and change them one by one. If you go to the upper right corner and click on the panel menu of the paragraph, paragraph styles panel, there is an option that says edit all export tags. This will allow you to see all the styles in your document as well as what tag is associated with it. So make sure in the upper left hand corner that you turn on the PDF radio button. This will allow you to see the PDF export options. And so when you click on um, each of the tags, it will bring down a drop, drop down menu and you'll be able to select which one. Controlling the tag order. When you export to an accessible PDF file out of InDesign, you want to make sure that the order of the tags is appropriate to the content that you have on your pages. If you don't assign the order, InDesign will read each page from top left corner across and down. So we should try not to rely on the page structure to control the order of the export. To control the order, go to the Windows menu and choose Articles. The top, the job of the Articles panel, panel is to give you control of the order of the objects as they're exported. You can grab the first item on the page that you want to be read first and drop it into the articles panel. This will create a new article. Name it what you need and go ahead and click OK. Continue to grab each item of your page in the order that you want it to be read and drop it onto the articles panel. If your text is threaded together from page to page, you only need to grab the first frame and the whole thing will go along during the drop. One thing I want to point out here is that if you have figures in your threaded text that go in specific places, it will not transfer um, if it's not anchored. And we will touch on anchored images here in a minute. Another thing to keep in mind here is that the articles panel is an all or nothing proposition. If you don't add anything to the articles panel, it will automatically get artifacted. So that will be... Um, that's a great benefit or a bit of a challenge depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, so another uh, critical piece here before you export the PDF is that in the panel menu of the articles panel, you need to choose the option use for reading order in tagged PDF. If you do not enable that feature, all the work you just did in the articles panel will not be applied when you export to an accessible PDF. So remember, if you have an InDesign document that is anything but all flowing text, You'll need to take advantage of the articles panel to control the order of the tags as they're output in the accessible PDF file. Controlling the reading order. Now this is where it can get a little confusing um, when we talk about order inside of an accessible PDF. We just touched on the tag order, which is what assistive software uses to read the contents of a document. So the order in which the tags appear in the export of PDF controls the order that assistive software is going to read that information. The other order that we need to, to make sure is correct is the reading order. The way that we control the reading order is by using the layers panel in InDesign. If you open your layer that has your content, you'll see a stacking order of your content. The stacking order as it appears in InDesign is actually reversed for the reading order of the exported PDF. This part's really confusing. Or at least it confused me when I was going over it. Uh, the way to fix this is to adjust the stacking order by dragging each item to place in the correct order from bottom to top. The first item you want to be read should be on the very bottom, second item should be second from last, and so on. Now, depending on your design, you're not always going to be able to do this. Um, you won't always be able to stack the order exactly where you want it to be because things will be moving behind objects and you don't want that. Um, so you can do the best you can. If you can't do this work in InDesign, you can correct it in the PDF file after you export. The easiest way to do that is when you export your PDF and you go to the Accessibility tool, you click on the Reading Order pane and drag all the items to rearrange their order to match what you're trying to achieve. 
honestly, that's usually what I do. Um, because our designs are so complex that stacking orders moves things, and I don't want that to happen. OK, anchoring objects and text frames. In order to get elements, especially figures, to export a, at a very specific location inside of your document, it's often necessary to anchor images and other elements to the text. InDesign has the ability to create an anchored object that allows us to do just that. With anchored objects, there are some limitations, and I'll try to walk you through some workarounds here. So how do we anchor an element? You select the image, and you'll notice that there is a little blue square in the upper right corner. So to anchor an object, you would click on that square and drag it to where you want to anchor that within the text. Now, one thing to remember, the first limitation you run into is that if you try to anchor it right at the beginning of a paragraph of text that wraps around this image, it will not work. Text wrap cannot be applied to the first line of a paragraph in which the object is anchored. So here, it was anchored to the end of the section title, and that's when it worked. If you run into too many issues with anchored objects, you can just put it at the very end of the article in the articles panel and just drag the tag to the proper location that you want the figure and caption to be read in the text once you've exported it. Working with tables. InDesign does the best job of creating accessible tables. It has a powerful table formatting capability, and merging and splitting cells are handled very well in the resulting PDF file, as opposed to Word. Tables there are really hard to work with. Um, the key thing to remember with InDesign when you're working with tables is that you have to have a header row for the PDF to pass an accessibility test. When you originally create a table, you go to Table, Insert Table, you can define the amount of header rows, body rows, columns you want. You can also apply to table style. If you're editing a previously made table that did not have a header row defined, you can highlight that row, choose table, then convert rows to header. And that way, your table will now pass. When you export your PDF and run the accessibility checker, you'll probably notice that you'll have a summary failure for your tables. To add a summary to a table in Adobe Acrobat, just go to Accessibility Tool and then the Reading Order, select your table, right click, and select Edit Table Summary. And once you put that in, press OK, then it should pass. Working with lists. Lists such as bulleted lists or numbered lists need to be tagged in a unique way so that they are properly read in an accessible PDF. So it's important that you build your list the correct way. If you look at your paragraph formatting, you'll see that there is a bulleted list option as well as a numbered list option. Using these, it will ensure that, you, that when you export your file, it will automatically be tagged as a bulleted or numbered list. You can create a paragraph style that is formatted, that formats a bulleted list the way that they should be. The incorrect way of creating a list is that instead of using a bulleted list feature or a numbered list feature, you type in a bullet character or a number character followed by a space or table and format it that way. Not only is that a bad idea from a formatting perspective, but it will also not export as a list and it will be read incorrectly. So when you export your PDF and look at your tags, you'll see each bulleted item is a list item that has a label applied to the bullet and an L body applied to the contents of the bullet. So you'll see in the screenshot that it is, it is tagged correctly. Adding alternative text for images and graphics. So all of the figures and images used in your document need to have alternative text applied to them. There are a couple of methods to do this in InDesign. So if you click on the alt text tab, oh, excuse me, select your image or graphic, go to the object menu, and choose object export options. If you click on the Alt Text tab, you can choose Custom and type in your text into that field. Click Done and your Alt Text is added. When you export, you can find that figure in your tags. Right click on the figure tag and choose Properties and you'll see that the alternative text that you added has been carried over or into the PDF. Some information that I did not include in this slide, but it will be in the Word document, is an alternative way to add alt text by using Adobe Bridge.
All right, creating bookmarks for your PDF. Bookmarks are a powerful tool that can aid in navigation for both sighted and non-sighted users. It is worth noting that most accessibility checkers require bookmarks for PDFs that have nine or more pages. So to do this, you go to the Windows menu, click Interactive, and then choose Bookmarks. This will bring up the Bookmarks panel. This way is good if you do not plan on having a table of contents in your document. And table of contents information will be included into the Word document, but will not be covered in this presentation just yet. So basically, you can select a tool bo uh, text box and click on, a, on the new bookmark option, bookmark button, and that will add a bookmark to the bookmarks panel. Once you export this to a PDF, you can open your bookmarks panel and you'll see all the bookmarks for your entire document. So you'll see this in the screenshot. Okay, finishing touches. So once your InDesign document is complete, you can export it to a PDF. Once it opens in Adobe Acrobat, you can perform a full check on your PDF to make sure it is accessible. So to do this, you go to your accessibility tool and click on full check. There will always be at least two to three issues that you will have to contend with when you do this. So uh, click start checking. This will bring up a list on the left hand side. It'll have seven categories and will list out which items you passed or failed. The great thing about this is if you don't know how to fix it, all you have to do is right click on the item you failed and click explain. This will bring up a web page explaining the issue and how to fix it in Adobe Acrobat. Once you go through these steps, right click on the issue again, click check again. This will tell you if what you did was correct or not by changing it to passed or staying at failed. Especially if it's a multi-page PDF, under the page content category, the tab order will show up as a fail. It's an easy fix. You just need to right click, choose fix, and it's done and it will pass. It'll automatically correct the tabs for you. Okay, there will be reading order and color contrast warnings that will remind you that you need to manually check them. Reading order can be checked and corrected through the reading order category. Color contrast is important for low vision users. There is a color contrast at analyzer you can download that will help you test your document if there is any question about your contrast. I'll include that link in the resources at the end of this presentation. So like how Liz mentioned before, to listen to how your PDF will be read in Adobe Acrobat, you go to view, read out loud, then activate read out loud. Then you have to go back to view read out loud, then choose read this page only or read to the end of the document. So once every item is passed, your PDF should be ADA compliant. So that's it for this presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions, they can ask through your microphone or through the chat. We can try to answer to the best of our ability. Um, if we don't know the answer, we'll make sure to make a note and we can research it for you and uh, email you any answers. On here, you'll see the resources used. Uh, I will give credit to Chad Chelius from lynda.com. I uh, used his sample PDF and most of his information that he provided in that, um, that video. Uh, this is a link for the color contrast, a link for the PAC 3.0 checker, and the PAVE link. So does anybody have any questions? OK. Can we get the uh, PowerPoint? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, I'll provide the PowerPoint and this <coughs> Word document if you guys want them. Yes, please. Okay, let's see. What percentage would be required to pass? For your web page or your PDF? I mean, it just has to pass. Yeah. I, I don't think there's a certain percentage. The percentage would be 100. 100%. 100%. Okay, do you have a ready-made checklist of items to consider as you work through a document? Um, basically, you can use this as your checklist. And these are all of the things that you need to, to look through. Um, if you want to create a checklist, you can just go to your, um, your Adobe Acrobat PDF, go to your accessibility tool, click on full check, and any of those in there 
have to pass. So you can use that as a checklist if you need to. It's 100% for PDF accessibility. Sean's asking, uh, one thing we struggle with is what percentage would be required to pass. It's 100%. Would you go over the online charts and tables guidelines? Okay. The online charts, tables, and guidelines, do we want yeah. to go back to my yeah, we PDF? Can do that. online tables yeah okay <clears throat> so on tables on the actual web page you want to use simple data tables with row headers column headers or both so you don't want to put a complex table on there or an image of a table so for example on our website that we use we use a content management system and you can go to the content module and insert a table instead of copying a table. I found if someone tries to copy a table from Word, it doesn't, the layout doesn't go in correctly. So it's best to use your web page and it should have where you can actually insert a table onto the page. And then you would, not to use the, for your layout, but just to put your headers or the column, the row header, column header, or, the, or both onto the page. So I guess, what, what specifically do you have a question um, it, that you, do you have about the table? Who was asking that question? Suzanne Steele. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, we got another really good question. Um, so if you're not supposed to have text on an image, should we not be using infographics? And this is a question I've had myself. I haven't done the research on it. Right. What do, you, what do you suggest? Infographics can be difficult, but what you can do with an infographic, I mean, you put in an infographic, but you still have to have all the text and the content on the page. So then to a sighted person, they're seeing the information twice. So unless it's short information you can include that into the alt text if it's 125 characters or less then you can put that into the alt text but yeah the infographics can pose a problem if yeah. you have a lot of text in the infographic i'll see if i can do some more research on that and include it in the word document any more questions Okay, so um, I can provide these, uh, these slides, the Word document. Um, if you guys want to email me, um, and I'll just respond with them, my email is a-i-v-e-r-s-o-n at agcenter.lsu.edu. Oh, one. how do you make emails accessible? All right. Um, email, okay. Well... Whenever you send an email, then you basically have to follow all the compliance rules you would for anything else. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't use all caps in your email, as far as I know. I don't, <clears throat> I'm not sure how the readers read the email. I'm mostly a web person. So, but you would just, like for example, if you put an attachment in your email, because I've had people tell me, well, you know what, if I can't put my PDF on the website, I'll just email it to my people. Well, that's not a workaround for the law. You have, if you put a PDF or any attachment in an email, it also has to be 100% accessible. And so just basically, if you follow the same rules for web and PDF accessibility, you can't go wrong. So I'm not an email expert, but that's what I would recommend. Same thing with social media. I'm not the social media guru, but your social media, like Facebook, anything that you post on there has to be accessible. Yes. 
So Michelle made a good point. For email, remember call to action buttons are images and need, and need alt text. All right, if we don't have any further questions, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I know it was a bunch of information that we just threw at you, um, but we'll be happy to answer any further questions that you may have. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.